A few months back when I was researching one of these videos, I read this book, China's Urban Revolution by Austin Williams. In the book, Williams tells us the story of a mythological Chinese character called Yu the Great. Yu was the founder of the Xi dynasty, which existed between 2100 and 1600 BC. Williams tells us that Yu faced great environmental catastrophe during his time, and he tells us this. Yu, when confronted by potential devastation, builds flood defences, reroutes rivers, dredges channels, constructs canals, and tames those forces that threaten his community. Not only are the floods averted, but the raging waters are rooted to irrigate the fields, leading to agricultural plenty. And it looks like China's got their own modern day version of Yu the Great in the shape of President Xi Jinping. In 2013, Xi announced the most ambitious social and engineering project since the Marshall Plan back at the end of the Second World War. Only this project looks like catapulting China to the top of the global economic tree within a generation. The question is though, at what price for climate change mitigation? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Thing. For hundreds of years, traders used the old Silk Road to bring goods back and forth between Europe and China. It wasn't just one long single road, of course, it was a vast intertwined network of meandering routes crisscrossing the huge open spaces of the Asian continent on their way to Europe, bringing not just goods and livestock, but also an exchange of cultural and religious ideas across country and continental borders. As seagoing navigation gained in popularity though, so the old Silk Road gradually fell from favour. But some of those same sea routes, especially in the South China Sea, are becoming hotly contested today by other regional players like Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia and Vietnam. And at the same time, the drivers of China's astonishing growth since 1980 are now changing. This briefing paper by the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute sums up China's position 40 odd years ago. In the late 1970s, in the immediate aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese economy was close to collapse. The economic gap between China and the developed countries was growing, and more than 250 million people in rural China, which comprised 82% of the total population, were living in poverty, most on less than a dollar a day. So the then Premier Deng Xiaoping implemented the reform and opening up policy, integrating China into the global marketplace. The result of that was that by 2011, China's GDP per capita had risen to $6,400, China itself had become the second largest economy in the world behind the United States, and almost 200 million people had been lifted out of poverty. That really was a minor miracle for those people, at least economically speaking, but the country paid a very high price for its meteoric growth because the Chinese economy wasn't the only thing that got opened up. They also opened up the country's almost unimaginably large resources of coal in order to fuel their industries, which meant that by 2010, 80% of the country's energy was derived from coal. By the early 2000s, this major environmental calamity had coincided most inconveniently with a second problem, which was that China's competitiveness on the world stage had started to diminish as domestic wages grew and the huge cheap labor force that China once relied on to pump out goods far cheaper than any Western nation could match had moved into the cities and got themselves well-paid jobs. So by 2011, China had two major problems to address. It was choking its citizens to death all over the country and it was losing ground in the global markets that it relied upon for its prosperity. Enter President Xi Jinping with a master plan for the 21st century. It would become known as the New Silk Road, but its official title is the Belt and Road Initiative. It includes trade routes over land and sea that stretch all the way from China to Western Europe. Here's a quote from a Yale 360 report by Isabel Hilton from January 2019. China's Belt and Road Initiative, launched by President Xi Jinping in 2013, has been described as the most ambitious infrastructure project in history. It's a plan to finance and build roads, railways, bridges, ports and industrial parks abroad, beginning with China's neighbours in Central, South and Southeast Asia, and eventually reaching Western Europe and across the Pacific to Latin America. 
And here's a few statistics from the World Bank, just to remind us all of the sheer scale of ambition involved. The initiative secures links between China and some 65 other countries that account collectively for over 30% of global GDP, 62% of global population, and 75% of known energy reserves. The goods traded between China and the other countries involved in the initiative topped $6 trillion between 2013 and 2018, growing up 4% per year. In those same five years, investment by Chinese companies into partner countries was $90 billion, with this number growing up 5.2% per year. The total value of new foreign contracts signed with partner countries surpassed $600 billion, with annual growth of 11.9%. To date, the Overseas Economic and Trade Cooperation Zones that Chinese enterprises have built in partner countries have created 300,000 local jobs with investment of more than $30 billion. On a purely financial level, all this sounds very positive for the countries involved, especially as a good majority of them are developing nations who could stand to benefit significantly from huge new transport and infrastructure projects providing jobs for their populations and new wealth for their economies. But of course, as with just about everything else that comes out of China, once you start scratching the surface, you quite quickly come to realise that there are intricacies, contradictions and side effects in just about every element of this vast project. For example, in order to facilitate China's outreach, Chinese banks have been dishing out huge loans to developing nation states like candy to babies, often with virtually no checks on whether the country concerned has got any chance whatsoever of ever repaying the money. Ostensibly, this might look like an amazingly altruistic gesture by China, not only providing funding for programs that they were unlikely to ever get a financial return on, almost like some kind of state aid program. But the conditions of the deals that Chinese investors strike with these countries tend to be overwhelmingly stacked in China's favour. More and more Chinese backers are insisting on replacing the dollar with the Chinese renminbi as the contract currency. And contracts usually state that Chinese companies have to be used to build the infrastructure and plant in those countries, which means vast sums of money being repatriated back to the motherland. In some cases, there are pretty heavy penalties for defaulting on the loans too, usually involving a clause that would allow China to take possession of infrastructure or industrial plant in the event of a default on repayments. As Isabel Hilton explains in her 360 report, the first phase of transport and energy infrastructure and seaports will enable a level of industrial development and economic integration that Beijing hopes will generate new markets for Chinese companies and create a Chinese dominated network of countries tied into China's economic and industrial realm. If successful, it would create a sphere of technological, economic, diplomatic and strategic power big enough to challenge that of the United States. During the second meeting of the Belt and Road Forum, which took place back in April in Beijing, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this. That the Belt and Road Initiative assumes remarkable and urgent importance. With the scale of its planned investments, it offers a meaningful opportunity to contribute to the creation of a more equitable, prosperous world for all and to reversing the negative impact of climate change. Guterres also pointed out China's remarkable world-leading achievements in implementing green technologies within its own borders. And on the face of it, they are spectacular. Here's the cold hard numbers. In 2017 alone, the country invested $125 billion in renewable energy. In that year, China installed 52.8 gigawatts of solar power, almost twice as much as the USA, Europe and India combined. They also added 19.5 gigawatts of wind to their energy mix, dwarfing India and the US again, and even outperforming the mighty wind energy powerhouse of Germany and the rest of Europe. But when it comes to investment outside its borders as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, China so far seems to be playing a very different role. According to this report by CNBC, China is still investing massively in coal projects outside its shores, notably in places linked to the Belt and Road project. One reason is to offload coal over capacity as China cracks down on the polluting industry at home. Huang Wei, a climate and energy campaigner at Greenpeace East Asia, added, Chinese banks and companies' investments in coal abroad 
are a cause of major concern because of their potential to lock in more climate warming emissions in our carbon constrained world. And in their haste to take the big easy money from Chinese backers, a lot of these developing nations run the very real risk of finding themselves with fossil fuel infrastructure that may become a stranded asset as climate change regulations become tighter and tighter in the coming years. At the imaginatively titled website Panda Paw Dragon Claw, they interviewed some of the people who actually work in China's banks and state-owned enterprises. To many of those people, the stranded assets argument didn't seem to ring any alarm bells at all. They found that Chinese companies tend to already see themselves as shielded from such long-term risks through the means of contracts at the project planning stage. One example of such a contract is the Power Purchase Agreement, or PPA, signed during the initial stages of investments in power plant projects. The PPA provides certainty in future price, volume and time period for electricity sold, meaning that any further cost of retrofitting would be borne by the recipient country government and not by Chinese companies. And when a country is already struggling to repay its initial borrowing, this kind of extra burden years down the line may become something that's more than they can shoulder. And then there's China's other great passion, hydropower. According to this 2018 publication by the Stockholm Environment Institute, most BRI-supported hydropower dams will be built in the Mekong region. In Laos and Cambodia, China so far has developed more than 20 dams, and most of them have been considered as contributions to the BRI vision. Despite their apparent short-term low emissions, hydropower dams also come with a number of risks associated with climate vulnerability and potential damages to local communities and ecosystems, including longer-term methane emissions and changes to water levels, sediment distribution and fish stocks. And it's not just hydropower that threatens this delicate ecosystem. China also wants to develop the Mekong River from the sustainable local resource that it represents today into a major shipping lane of the future. The Mekong is a big wide river, but it's got lots of shelves and rapids along its length, making it unsuitable for big ships. But engineers from the China Communication Construction Corps have been actively surveying the waters to assess whether they can blast these shelves and rapids out of existence, making way for 500 ton cargo ships to pass through with all of the huge environmental and ecological damage that this would cause. The Stockholm Environment Institute's report continues by saying, an important question asks whether Belt and Road Initiative investments will contribute to or undermine global efforts to tackle climate change and pursue sustainable development. If BRI investments are green and low carbon, they can be a strong engine promoting and leading the way for the environmentally sustainable and resilient infrastructure development that is essential for achieving the global sustainable development goals, and especially for tackling climate change. If they're brown and carbon intensive, it could result in significant carbon lock-in, exacerbating the climate change threat. More recently, there are tentative signs that China's beginning to listen and respond to the growing international criticism of their policies. According to Panda Poor Dragon Claw, the second Belt and Road Forum back in April included far greater emphasis on the climate environment than in previous meetings. The green updates rolled out this time include the formal launch of the International Coalition for Green Development on the Belt and Road and the signing of the Green Investment Principles. Consisting of 26 countries, 8 international organisations, 65 non-governmental organisations and academic institutions and 30 businesses, the coalition is an open, inclusive and voluntary international network to ensure that the Belt and Road brings long-term green and sustainable development to all concerned countries. And the forum also signed off a set of guidelines called the Green Investment Principles, co-developed by the China Green Finance Committee and the City of London, and signed at the forum, the initiators of the principles will establish a secretariat that offers services for the signatories, which has the China Development Bank, China Exim Bank and Silk Road Fund among them. The services include a database for green projects under the BRI, a carbon emission calculator for development and investment projects, and a knowledge sharing platform. Now I know there's lots of folks watching this who are living and working in some of the countries that are affected by the Belt and Road Initiative because I hear from many of you regularly. 
Some of you may have first-hand experience of some of the consequences that we've talked about today. And if you do, then I'd love to hear your feedback and also your overall view of the Belt and Road Initiative in the comments section below. As usual, I've left links to all the articles and papers that I looked at during my research for this programme, and you can get to them by scrolling down past the video description below. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the programme useful and informative. And if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel to help us get these messages out to as many people as possible. And if you hit the little bell icon as well, then you'll get notified of whenever a new episode comes out. It's really easy to subscribe and it's completely free. All you need to do is click on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.